Well, good morning, New Hope. I hope that you're doing well. To those joining online, I just want to say welcome, and we're glad that you could join us. We miss seeing you in person, but I'm very grateful that uh, you're joining with us. On October 16th of 2022, we started a series in Genesis, and this morning will be sermon number 37 of that series, of this never-ending series, thus the title of my message the end. So uh, turn to your neighbor and say, we're there, okay? Well, we obviously have taken several breaks over the last 21 months, but I have enjoyed uh, thoroughly uh, to be able to not just see a, a micro perspective of God's Word, but to, to look at the intertextuality of God's Word and, and see a macro perspective of, of how God is speaking to us. And, and we believe that the Bible is the living word of God. It is, it is alive today. And what that means is that there's no expiration date on the words in these pages. I could read the Bible a thousand years ago. I can read it today. I could read it in a thousand years. And even though the stories that we're reading about, they took place thousands of years ago, they still apply to me, there's truth, and it's true for all people of all context in all time, and that's how the Word of God is alive. And as we read the written Word of God, it points us to the person of Jesus Christ who is described as the living Word of God. See, Jesus perfectly demonstrates everything that we find in the written Word of God. So as we read the Word of God, we see the person of Jesus Christ, the living word. He's described as being the living word. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 45. We, uh, we get excited about the word of God and we celebrate it and I'm gonna be covering, pray for me and I'll pray for you. We're gonna be covering the last five chapters of Genesis and there is a lot to unpack. So as I unpack, this is what I ask, is that you take notes. If you uh, tend to get distracted on your phone, like I sometimes do, just go ahead and slip it on to airplane mode, put the focus time on, uh, put it away, lean in, and let's learn from the Word of God. And to give brief context of those who might be joining for the first time, as a boy, where we're at in Genesis, as a boy, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And they lied to his father that he was killed by wild beasts. And through many trials and ups and downs, Joseph is now the second most important and powerful person in all of Egypt. And there's a great famine in the land, not just the land of Egypt, but all the surrounding areas, even up into the land of Canaan. Um, and, and Joseph's brothers that sold him into slavery, they have traveled from their homeland to buy food in Egypt. And not being recognized, Joseph has just tested his brothers to see if they're honest, to see if they've changed their ways. And so that's where we pick up today. And as I read the Word of God, this is a good question for you to ask anytime you're reading the Word of God. These are two questions. As we read the Word of God, what does this text reveal about God? And how does it point to Jesus? Especially when we're reading in the Old Testament, what does this reveal about God and his character and his nature? And how does what I'm reading point to the future of the person of Jesus Christ? So keep that in your mind as we read Genesis 45, starting in verse 1. Buckle up, because we've got a lot. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence! So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. 
So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all that you have. And I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Verse 12, you can see for yourselves and so can my brother Benjamin that it it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and everything you have seen. And bring my father down to here, down here quickly. Then in verse 14, he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. Now, Benjamin, out of all the brothers uh, that Joseph has had, Benjamin is his biological brother. They both shared Rachel as a mother. The rest are, uh, you know, half brothers. Um, they shared the same father. In verse 15, after hugging his, his uh, blood brother, you know, then he hugs his half-brothers. And, and uh, it, it says that he wept over them. And afterward, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all of his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan, which is the promised land that God gave Abraham, gave Jacob, um, and, and the future Israelites, and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that in this sermon that you would speak through me and that we, myself included, that we would all hear your voice, that we would all take steps closer to the center of your will. I pray, Lord, for anyone that is uh, confused or lost or in a place of desperation, that we would just hear your voice, we would respond. So help me, God, to be able to communicate your words and allow us to each individually receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So we ought to take note of some similarities that happen in Scripture. First, the similarities between Joseph saving his brothers from physical starvation and death and Jesus saving us from spiritual starvation and spiritual death. And the first thing that we notice is that like Joseph, Jesus typically reveals himself in private. Verse 1, Joseph has everybody leave his presence, and he reveals his true identity to his brothers. Let me ask you, do you really want God to reveal himself to you in a way that leads to to being saved? Do you want to see Jesus through the correct lens to see him rightly? I encourage you to seek God in privacy, to to read his word and, and study the scriptures alone. Spend time in prayer alone. And the revelation of God's great love for you, it's not likely to come until you spend alone time with God. Now, many of you, when you first had the revelation of who Jesus was, you know, that happened to you while you were at church. But I would be willing to bet that in that moment, it felt like you were the only person in the room. It was as if the lights went out, all else grew dim, and God's presence and his voice, it was just like you just having this personal encounter with the Lord, and it didn't matter that there was 15 other people or 15,000 other people in the room. God was revealing himself personally and privately to you. You hear the gospel, then God The Holy Spirit moves in grace and he quickens and reveals a spiritual deadness. A light ray of truth and glory and beauty shines in where it has never gone before. It touches a deep part of you that you have never had awakened in your life and you experience something that you have never known. And all of a sudden you know 
that this is real and nothing and no one can take that from you. And you become not just an advocate for a system, but a witness to a reality. If you have yet to experience Jesus revealing himself to you, I'd encourage you to push past all external distractions this morning. Put away your phone. Try to push past the distractions. Ignore the people around you and simply pray and ask God, God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would I see you rightly? Can I see your face today? It's not about the worship leader. It's not about the pastor. Nobody else. I don't want my eyes on anything else, just you. So help us, Lord, this morning to hear from you and to see you and you only. Now, jumping back into our text in verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they were terrified at his presence. I don't know about you. But if I were one of Joseph's brothers, I would have been absolutely terrified too. I would have been standing there completely afraid of what he was going to do. They were guilty and there was no way around their conviction. In a moment, shame and guilt hit them like a tidal wave. In a moment, what they spent a lifetime trying to forget and bury in the past is now standing before their very eyes. What guilt, what remorse, what a horrible feeling of realizing of how bad a decision that they had made, that they sinned against a person who is now seated in a place of authority and 100% justified, like he's able to, to punish them and kill them justifiably. What remorse, what guilt, and they were terrified. And in the same way the brothers responded to Joseph revealing his identity, the first response to the revelation of Jesus often brings great woe in your life. There's this realization of just how sinful and how dirty and how guilty and shameful we are and just how holy and beautiful and wonderful and perfect God is. And we see all throughout scripture that when people get in the presence of God and they encounter God, that, that there is this um, uh, physical response that takes place. In Genesis 17, Abraham collapsed when God spoke to him. In Joshua 5, he falls to the ground when he experienced the presence of God. Ezekiel and Daniel, they both um, uh, fall to the ground when the glory of God appears. Isaiah saw the Lord, and what does he say in Isaiah 6? Woe is me. There's this distress, a man of unclean lips. I see my depravity. I see my sinfulness. I see just how far far I've fallen short of you. Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John collapse when Jesus was transfigured. Saul on the road to Damascus and John on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation. They fall to their feet of Jesus as if they were dead. Moses was terrified when he encountered God at the burning bush and God spoke. See, it can feel overwhelming. It brings you to tears. It might take you to your knees. It shakes you to your core. But soon after, our response changes. Looking at verses four and five, it says this, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. The brothers are absolutely terrified and Joseph says, come closer. Don't feel bad. Don't be angry with yourself. Uh, Joseph, uh, then in verse 14, he he throws his arms around him. He kisses his brother Benjamin and and they embrace and they talk and they hug and they weep. And Joseph, Joseph is saying, I'm here to save your life. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to condemn you. I am here to save you. Don't, don't, don't feel bad for what you've done. I'm here to save you. See, their fear is met with Joseph's deep desire to be in relationship with him again. 
Joseph is full of mercy and grace and love. And what happens is their initial response of great woe is quickly turned into the greatest possible joy. So it is with Christ. When we see him rightly and we're in awe and there's this moment of fear and trembling and then we, we hear his voice, come closer. And we take that step in. We hear him speak again, I forgive you. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry about what you have done. I'm here to save you, not punish you. And the second response to the revelation of Jesus Christ brings the greatest possible joy. If you've never heard, Jesus is inviting you to come closer so that he can forgive you, that he can save you, and that he can bless you abundantly. He's not mad at you. There's this miss. Um, understanding of the God that we serve that sweeps over many people. And, and maybe you can relate to this, that God is upset with you, that God wants nothing to do with you and your sinfulness and the things that you've done and the decisions that you've made and the mistakes. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. God is inviting you, come close do not be upset with yourself. Don't be at distressed in my presence. I'm here to save you. All week long, I've had this old hymn stuck in my head, and some of you might know this. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinners, come home. It actually sounds way better in my head because it's Alan Jackson singing it. <laughs> um, but if you are away from God, would you hear his gentle, soft, tender cry calling you in? I love you. I forgive you. Do not be distressed and don't be angry with yourself. I am here to save you. Receive the Lord's forgiveness. Receive his blessing today. And at the end of my sermon, I'm going to give anyone who is away from the Lord an opportunity to come home. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and then I'll lead you in a prayer of repentance and salvation. And if your heart is burning right now and you know that if you were to die that you are not right with God and you need to make things right with God, I'm, I'm, God is, this is your moment. This is the moment of grace. This is the moment of revelation where his spirit is speaking to you. Do not delay. I encourage you. Respond. Respond. Looking back to our text, Joseph loads his brothers up with food and goods and money, and he sends them to go get his father, Jacob, who also has the name Israel, right? Jacob's name changes to Israel, so if you see Israel, if you see Jacob in this context, same person, and he instructs everyone to come back to Egypt, and I find this hilarious in verse 24 of, of 45. Joseph says this, he then sent his brothers away, and as they were leaving, he said, hey, don't quarrel on the way, <laughs> right? Do you think it like, could have been like an argument that got his butt sold into slavery in the first part? <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to teach this punk kid of, you know, son of Rachel, you know, your favorite child, and you know, all this stuff, and he's like, hey, don't make that same mistake twice. You better not sell Benjamin, just remember who I am. I've got the food, right? Like, just, maybe it didn't happen that way. Verse 25. So they went out of Egypt and they came up to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of all of Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them, but when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts that Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel, or Jacob, said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive and I will go see him before we... I die. Now tonight I'm preaching actually message number 38, the real end, and it's titled From Grief to Belief. And I hope that you'll come ready to worship the Lord and uh, encourage one another. That's at 6 p.m. tonight. Continuing in our text, verse 46. This is 
where it gets good. So Israel, Jacob, he set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. So what's significant about Beersheba is that Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and his father, Isaac, dug seven wells in Beersheba. And so he's returning to his faith roots He's returning and he's offering a sacrifice to the Lord. And in verse two, God spoke to Israel or Jacob in a vision at night. And he said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Now, why would he say don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, right? Anybody grow up hearing grand, or stories from like your grand? pa or grandfather, grandma, stuff. Do you think that Abraham maybe said, dude, let me tell you about this one time. I went down to Egypt without consulting of the Lord and it just, it caused all sorts of issues, right? There could be a little apprehensive tendency in, uh, apprehension in, in, in Jacob at this moment. Like all I've heard about Egypt is that it didn't work good for our family. So God is speaking to that. Continuing on in verse three, for I will make you into a great nation there. And I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Meaning Joseph's gonna be there when you die and he's gonna close your eyes and he'll be with you. Now, does this sound familiar to any of you? This is the same promise that Jacob's uh, grandfather received in Genesis chapter 12. But here's where things get interesting. And if you're slightly nerdy like me, take some notes. Wave your hand if you're still with me. Wave your hand if you're tapping out and you're like, I'm done. Okay, a couple people. I saw that, Ethan Smith. Oh, man, I call you out, boy. (laughs) Verse 4, okay? Take some notes. Verse 4, God is speaking to Jacob and he says this. I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again. Now, the question that I've asked all week long, does you refer to only Jacob or does you refer to Jacob's family, the future nation of Israel? Now, I did some homework. I called my friend, Dr. Wave Nunley, who many of you are friends with and you know, and we had a lengthy discussion about this pronoun, you, and how it relates in the Hebrew. In verse three, which uh, the you in the Hebrew is plural. It could read, for I will make y'all into a great nation. It's like the first time the South have anything right, okay? Like, it's, it's plural in verse three. I will make y'all into a great nation there. But in verse four, you in the Hebrew is singular. Now, however, due to the context of the verses, it is possible that this singular pronoun is actually something called a singular collective pronoun. I know you're begging to know, what is a singular collective pronoun? If I use the word crowd, it's singular, but it's referring to a group of people. Or if I'm talking to my three children, and and I say, you need to come inside and put on your shoes, it's singular, but it's collective because I'm talking to all of them at the same time. So the question remains, is verse four, I will go down to Egypt with you and surely bring you back again, is it a promise from God that was meant only for Jacob or was it for Jacob's family, the future nation of Israel? And here's, here's I'm just gonna spoil it right now, okay? The truth is, is that whatever was spoken and whatever was intended, it came true. Jacob returned to the promised land when he was buried there, and eventually the nation of Israel returns to the promised land only after 400 years of of slavery. But the point is this, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. God is a promise keeper. But just for your fun, just for fun, turn to your neighbor and say, east for fun, okay? East for fun, stretchy pants, east for fun, okay? I want to ask a hypothetical question. Could it be possible, hear me, hear me church, could it be possible that the way things panned out wasn't God's plan A? 
Could it be possible that God really wanted Jacob and his family to return to the promised land immediately after the famine rather than after 400 years later? At that point in time, they could have returned with wealth and in a prime way to rule the land uh, of Canaan because Egypt had just plundered all of Canaan's resources. Now, I understand in Genesis 15 where the Lord warned Abraham that his descendants would be slaves for 400 years and they would be delivered with great possessions. But was that God's will or was that God's foreknowledge? So keep on chewing on that for a bit as I summarize the rest of 47. Jacob and his sons, they make it to Egypt and Pharaoh lets them settle in a land of Goshen, which is rich, fertile land, great for raising livestock. And then uh, Pharaoh gives uh, Jacob and his family all of his livestock and, and blesses them with all sorts of things. And during this time, Egypt continued to be this powerhouse during the famine. And, and people come to him and say, we need to buy food. And they're like, give us all your money. And then the next year they come back and they're like, last year you took all of our money. Well, give us your livestock. And, and then they exchange livestock for food. And then the third year they come back again and they say, you've already got our money. You've already got our livestock. What else can we do? Don't let us die. They give us your land and we'll give you food. But in the future, you owe Pharaoh 20% of whatever you harvest. They literally are raking their enemies and the surrounding area over the coals. They are plundering all of the wealth from the surrounding areas, including the promised land where Jacob and his sons came from. So at the very end of chapter 47, in verse 27, it says this, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen, and they acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Jacob lived in Egypt, how many? 17 years, and the years of his life were 147. And when the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, if I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh, which is weird, and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. Take me back to the promised land. I will do as you say, Joseph said. He gives him his word. He makes this weird oath. And then the rest of 48, Jacob then blesses Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and then at the very end, Jacob kind of starts to give his final will. Like these are his last dying words. And he starts with Joseph and his last wishes in 48, verse 21. Stick with me here. Then Israel, or Jacob, same person, said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land, uh, excuse me, back to the land of your fathers. In verse 22, and to you, I give one more ridge of land to your brothers, the ridge that I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. Now, here's the interesting thing. In verse 21, you in the Hebrew is plural. I'm about to die, but God will be with y'all and take y'all back to the land of your, which is also plural in the Hebrew, your fathers. And then in verse 22, it switches back to singular, and he's clearly talking about an inheritance that he's desiring only for Joseph, this double portion of land. Was it Jacob's desire that Joseph and his brothers actually return to the promised land? I certainly think that one could make a case for that. And had they returned and reestablished after living 17 years in Egypt, all the blessings, all the fertility, everything that's happening, could the Israelites, meaning Jacob's 12 sons and their families, could the Israelites, could they have continued to trust in God's promise without suffering? Did they really have to go through 400 years of slavery? Was it God's will that they became slaves? It is possible that Joseph and his brothers overstayed their assignment in Egypt. 
Could it be possible that slavery actually started, hear me, with comfortable living? That they became slaves to the comfortable life? I mean, why go back and reestablish things when Pharaoh is just giving them blessing after blessing after blessing? Why leave when the getting got good? Now, I understand that God knew in his foreknowledge that they would remain there and eventually become slaves. And we know that God uses suffering to produce a mature faith. You see that in Romans 5. You see that in James chapter 1 where it says this, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything God certainly uses trials but is God's will for his people to suffer or is it God's will for his people to trust him fully and be blessed. When God created the earth and everything was perfect in the garden and there's Adam and Eve, I believe that it was God's will that humanity just simply trusted God's word, followed his ways, and lived an abundant, blessed life. Now, while I understand that all of this is hypothetical, I do think that there are some challenging truths to consider, and this is where it gets practical and, and, and how we glean from this and apply it to our word first, it's important to know that God is faithful to his promise. Okay, whether Joseph and his brothers missed the mark of returning to the promised land or not, God was faithful to his promise. And, and when we miss God's will, anybody ever been there? Like, I, I know I dropped the ball, God, right? It's his great mercy and his grace that redirects our heart and redirects our paths, right? It, it, it's, it's like when we make a wrong turn in our car with Google Maps or Apple Maps pulled up or you miss your turn and it's like redirecting, redirecting, redirecting and you keep on going down the road, you know, and redirecting, redirecting, recalculating. Can, God can get us to where he wants us even if it's not plan A. Now, the road might become more difficult if we're on plan B or on plan C or for some of you, plan Z, right? We might get on some gravel or experience a level B road and it might take us a little longer to get there, but God is always recalculating our hearts. Why? Because he's faithful to his promise. Second, we see that God uses suffering to teach, refine, and redeem us. Whether that suffering, I think there's two, uh, there's way more uh, the theology of suffering, right? I'm not going to go down this rabbit trail. But there's two main types of suffering. There's self-induced suffering, and then there's fallen world suffering. Whether the suffering is a result of our own decisions, or it's the result of living in the fallen world, God never misses an opportunity to draw us closer to him. If you are here and you are suffering, with where you're at. You're struggling physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, spiritually. This is the perfect opportunity to draw close to the Lord. He's saying, come close to me. I am with you. It says in, in, in scripture that God is near those who are crushed in spirit, those who are broken hearted an opportunity to lean into the everlasting arms of God, our Heavenly Father, that loves us so much, that is burning and this burning desire to be in a relation, a close relationship with us. But he uses suffering to teach, refine, and redeem us. But thirdly, and here, here it is, we must make sure that we are not overstaying our assignment. Several times in Scripture, we see people who understood their assignment. Jesus being the best example of that. How many times was he going from one town to the other and he's like, I'm not worried that I'm four days late because my time and my assignment is not done here. You know, he's, he's sitting on the Garden of Gethsemane, which is just a 10 minute walk in the valley right across from Temple Mount. Some of you have been there. And he's praying, God, not my will, but your will. If there's any other way, God, I'll do it, right? 
But he understood his assignment and he obeyed and he walked in there even though he could have walked 10 minutes the other way and just disappeared forever. He understood his assignment, he didn't overstay it. We see other times in scripture where people see the blessing of understanding their temporary assignment. In Acts chapter eight, Philip understood his assignment in Samaria that it was temporary. And even though ministry was going good, even though there was miracles, even though there was blessings in where he was at, he felt the call of God to say, go down to Ethiopia. And because of that, he brought the gospel to a new nation and they received Christ as Lord. But in 1 Kings 13, for those who want some homework, there's an unnamed prophet that overstayed his assignment and things didn't turn out well for him nor the people he was supposed to be serving. I want to ask this question and my prayer is that you would hear God speak to you and allow God to answer this question for you. Not your own reason, not your own intellect, not what you feel or see about it, but what God sees about it. Could God be calling you out of a season of comfort and predictability and into a new season of trust? Now, you have to be careful when you hear a sermon like this. You have to be careful to not hear what I'm not saying, right? Like, what I'm not saying is that if things are good and you're living a blessed life, that there's something inherently wrong and that that just can't be God's will for you. But I'm also not saying that if you're living the the blessed life, um, that maybe God is calling you out of that. We we need to use godly wisdom, and that's uh, expressed, one, through whatever God is speaking to you. Does it align with God's written word? But two, bringing in godly counsel, spiritual mentors, where, where you might go to someone and say, I feel like God is asking me to do this. Guess what? It's okay to move a little bit slow as long as there's movement, right? It's, it's okay. It's, it's okay in that. My, my dad shared this in the, the first service, um, the acronym of HALT, H-A-L-T. Never make big decisions when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Some of you are like, that's me all the time. Like, right? Okay. <laughs> Why? Because if we are not emotionally healthy, if we're not spiritually in the best place, if we're alone, if we're on all these different things, these are some big decisions. We must move forward in godly wisdom. But could God be calling you out of a season of predictability and comfort into a new season of trust? Help us, Lord, to hear your voice. to to be at the center of your will and not just close. Would you stand to your feet and musicians, would you come? I know I shared a ton of information with you today and my heart is this. As you put away your notes, you put away your phone, this is a time to not leave or be distracted. This is a time to, to, for this this is honestly the most important five minutes, 10 minutes of, of today. Because everything that I have said is just man's voice. But right now, we have the opportunity to hear God's voice and what God says about your life and where you're at. And it's my heart that we collectively as a church all take one step closer to Jesus because it's its soft, tender voice saying, come close to me. Don't be distressed. I'm here I'm with you, I love you, I'm here to save you. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads, allow the spirit of God to speak to you. As I ask this question, are you where you're supposed to be right now? Go ahead and ask yourself that. Am I where I'm supposed to be right now? Happiness cannot be the thermometer of of that question. Just because you're happy doesn't mean that it's right and it doesn't mean that it's wrong. We must each individually hear the Spirit of God. Am I where I'm supposed to be or is my assignment shifting? Is it changing? Ask yourself this, am I doing what I'm supposed to do with where I'm at right now? Obedience 
is a key sign of your love and your devotion to Christ? Are you doing what the written will of God is asking you to do? And, and maybe you start there. Am I walking in obedience? But lastly, and most importantly, ask yourself this. Do I need a proper revelation of the person of Jesus Christ so that I can be saved? I'm not preaching eternal insecurity or security. I'm preaching when we see Christ, we recognize our need for a Savior. Do I need to be saved today because I know that I'm not right before God? If you would say yes to that question, I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up saying, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life, ruler of my life, or I don't have peace with God. I don't have peace that if I were to die that I would be in heaven. And I'm saying, I need a savior. I'm stepping in close to that soft, gentle, tender call of our Lord and Savior and say, Jesus, save me today. Yes, I see you to my right. Yes, I see you in the back. Yes, I see you up front. I see, yes, God, God sees you. God sees you in the back. He sees you with your hand high. Is there anyone else that would respond saying, God, save me? Can we just all repeat this, this prayer? Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I've done. I trust in you. I trust that you are the only one who can save. Help me, God. Forgive me, Lord. And change my heart. Change my thinking. I trust in your way. I trust in your plan. And so save me today. I will live for you the rest of my life. I invite your Holy Spirit to be full in my life to be full in my thinking. Help me and save me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And Jesus, this morning our eyes are on you. God, may we see your goodness. May we see your light. May we hear your voice. May we come running to you, God. It's all from you. It's all for you and it's all to you. And so this morning, collectively, may the bride of this church, New Hope, every individual collectively take a step towards you as we come running back to you. It's your goodness. It's your mercy. It's your love. It's your tenderness that draws us and it leads us to repentance. And so Jesus, this morning, wherever you want to take me, wherever you want to lead me, God, if you're calling me out of comfort or you're calling me back home, I am there with you because I recognize that life starts with you and it ends with you. It's all about you, the giver of life. So we ask that you would have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this.